All right, so what we're going to do today is uh, as a follow-up to the original two-step drill video that I posted. I had a lot of people ask questions and uh, at times perform the drill incorrectly. Uh, so from there, uh, what I noticed is that I need to do a better job in explaining uh, the motions and the setup of the drill. Uh, this will, this video here will be a uh, kind of mix of some of the video snips that I took in, in Texas. Uh, as well as a narrative in between those snips. And at the very end of this video, what we'll do is we'll take a look at a pitcher actually performing uh, the uh, two-step drill and break that down so that you guys can all get a better understanding as to, to how best to perform this drill. So here we go. If this is the plate here, okay? On the two steps, we want for a little while for her to go back so okay. she, she can really feel a stretch. So the stretch that we're talking about requires that the stride leg knee straighten and that the stride foot heel remain on the ground. Uh, this will engage or prepare uh, the large muscles in the leg. Get into, you know what I mean? To get into yes, the sprinter's position. Yes. But over time, because that's an illegal move, you're going to want to take lines. Okay? Yes, yeah, so we want to start with exaggeration. In which she, now, at a certain point, you're going to get to the point where she's only dropping her heel. Shortening the back step to only a heel drop and no step makes this drill legal, obviously. Uh, we need to continue to work toward reducing the back step, but don't um, sacrifice proper technique of stretching or into uh, what we call sprinter position for the simple sake of legality. Right. Okay. And that's where it becomes a legal pitch. And it just takes time. So you want to start here, then start here, okay, then start here, then start here, and then get to the point where they're dropping. Okay. We need to train the athlete in drills um, that create a feeling of power and speed off of the plate. Uh, doing so repetitively creates an expectation and a feel uh, that will become part of their natural motion. Drills that are, are aesthetic in nature, like the stork or the crane drills, they do not replicate the muscle activations and sequences that actually occur during a pitch. Balancing on one leg during the stride actually never occurs during a real pitch, and it's therefore time poorly spent. Because we're trying to create a feel where they get comfortable and powerful driving off the plate. Right. So that when they don't do that in the game, they don't feel like they really gave it. You know what I mean? Like, yes. So now you're creating an expectation for them to work for it. Correct. Know, like, hey, that's what a powerful drive feels like. Oh, that is. And this drive I just did wasn't. So now they need to work harder with it. Balance is absolutely necessary, um, but it varies with every pitch. And it's not done by taking the same stance, but it's instead done by allowing the front foot to center itself at the beginning of each pitch. It's only when the drive foot is weightless uh, that it will naturally find the balance it needs and center itself. Transferring all the weight to the stride foot is the only way uh, that this will... This slide right here is going to tell you whether or not she transferred her weight. Yes. If you see the hip move, okay, watch when I slide right now. My hip doesn't move. But if you see the hip move, then she pushed it back. Her pulled her foot oh, back. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Still. Excellent right. point. Excellent point. Okay. okay. To ensure that 100% of the weight is over one foot, you need to have the non-weight bearing foot up on point. Uh, this plantar flexion of the foot prepares the drive foot to become a rigid lever, which is a necessity for maximum drive force. So what I do when I'm working with younger kids is I, I have them start on point. Yes. Because unless you're a ballerina, you can't bear weight there. Okay. And then as they come back, I have them get up on point too. Yes. Because you can't bear weight on that. Right on. Where if we just let their foot stay flat, they can still be holding weight on. We need to ensure that the drive foot heel is barely in contact with the front of the plate, which is just the tip of the shoe, and that the stride foot toe should barely touch the back of the plate. You need to use all six inches of depth. Our ability to create maximum space between the feet allows us to create the greatest levels of momentum prior to pushing off the rubber. The body's center of gravity must move in rearward to create momentum. The center of your body or the center, center of gravity, gravity is has to shift. Yep. That's and what shifts. A false load occurs when less than all of the body's weight does not shift or load rearward onto the stride leg. When this happens, the center of gravity remains unchanged. No momentum is created and poor posture needs to be overcome. What's called a false load is what Nick just really did. Okay? So if you do this, have I really changed my center of gravity? No. No, it's no. still right over my front foot. Okay? And so you'll see girls do this and a backswing, and they're still on their front foot. Correct. Okay? Finish transferring weight while establishing a lean. If you start the backswing of the pitching arm too early, timing problems can arise. As such, the backswing should be delayed, or what I call disconnected, from the rearward weight transfer and the lean. So it needs to be this first, then a lean, then a backswing. Okay. You don't want the hands going back with the butt. Okay. Okay? You know, is don't let them bend and backswing. Yes. Center of gravity is critical. Well, center of gravity is critical, but delaying arm movement 
starting, yes. that, starting this, then getting the lean, then going, will shorten yes. the backswing and also create the, the urgency for them to get up the surface. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Although you should work towards eliminating the, uh, eliminating the rearward step in the stride foot, the drive foot step is one we need to maximize. And improving the drive foot step is accomplished by centering using a pawing motion into the front of the plate. Pawing means that the foot should travel in a motion that is backwards and down while plantar flexed, meaning that the toe is down and the heel is up. What we're going to do is we're going to train the athlete to take the rear step out, okay. but we can't, and I don't care what people say, I don't care if they call it a gym step or not, we can't take the front step out. That push into the rubber tells you with what force they are pushing off the rubber. A gym step occurs when the dry foot does not use a pawing motion toward the plate, but instead takes a step forward away from the plate. This is not part of the drill and should immediately be corrected. Now here's where most girls go wrong. And I, I've seen Cheyenne do this incorrectly. Okay? And I've seen KK do it once or twice incorrectly. They'll come back here, and I'm fine with that. But as they go to step, they step forward. Okay. You see how my foot did not go into the yes. rubber? Yes, yes. If your DD is gym stepping away from the plate, the fix is to have her establish more of a lean earlier on. A lean should create forward momentum, and as the body is moving forward through space, a powerful drive from the plate will require a pawing motion. Okay, so as we come here, we need to have such a lean built that we are pushing inward into the plate. Um, so as you come through here, man, like you want this motion down. Yes. And that motion down is impossible unless they have a good lean established. Right. Pushing from a place other than the plate is illegal. A forward step puts the stride leg further behind the drive leg. This requires that the stride leg um, to travel a greater distance, which takes more time and negatively impacts the timing of the pitch. A gym step, which is here. Yes. And then look at the space that I've created that my knee has to shoot through. It's too far. Okay. okay. And that'll screw up your timing. It, it will. It'll screw it up because it puts the one critical component, one joint, at a later, yes. later point. Yes, I can see that. Sequence. So as you come through here, the slide back, look at how close my feet are together now. Yes. And now look how little space my knee has to work through. Correct. Okay, and that'll help a lot with time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and loop this video of a younger pitcher um, that I work with performing the two-step. This is her first go at the drill, um, and although uh, we'll pinpoint a few things she needed to tweak, I'd say she performed it pretty marvelously for her first go, especially at the age of 10. The drill is best performed with a plate, obviously, before we get to it. Uh, that plate was missing <laughs> that particular day, uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at how her feet are set up. As you can see here, her drive foot, uh, she is a right-handed pitcher, so her drive foot is her is her right foot, and as you can see, she has all of her weight uh, on that right foot. Um, if we go ahead and look back at her left foot here, you can see that she has that position up on what I call point. Uh, that's where the tip of the shoe is resting on the ground. This will tell us as a coach, as a parent, um, that she's not bearing weight on that. And that's a really, really, really important part uh, to this drill. Uh, also, what I'd like you guys to actually notice is the spacing that is between her drive foot and her stride foot. The plate that we pitch from is six inches deep by 24 inches wide. Uh, and one of the things that she did marvelously in this particular example um, was that she spaced her feet out using the entire depth of the plate. Uh, that said, one of the things that she could do better <coughs> is that she could actually utilize a wider stance. And I really like to see this is that it allows the pitcher to, to center, uh, to find her own center on each and every pitch. Uh, rather than start from a stationary position with the feet close together, uh, it's really handy to have a pitcher start wide uh, so that when they center, they find the true center and the true balance for that particular pitch. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a closer look at uh, the way she's presenting at this point. As you can see, her hands are together uh, up at chest level. Um, and I believe this is a good position to start. And the reason I believe that um, is that it gives the pitcher a little more time and a little more space to work her backswing through. Um, as we go through here, you can see that the arm is, is having to travel the length of her body and before it really goes behind her body. So there's a lot of movement. And this particular distance here delays the true part of the backswing. To me, a backswing happens beyond 6 o'clock. So here is the backswing. This is, to me, not a backswing. Uh, it's more of a preparatory. So if we consider that, what many young pitchers and many pitchers that have timing issues are guilty of is they, they incorporate or they connect 
uh, their backswing into their lean or bend, if you will. And if you start the backswing too early, uh, what happens is we don't get uh, what I call, uh, and what's been referred to as overlap. And you can see overlap again. That's going to be here. I want, for overlap to be established, I want the body itself um, to be headed in this direction. And I want the arm to be headed in that direction. Okay. Um, and it all starts when the arm falls to 6 o'clock. So as you can see here, her arm, she started just a little early, and her arm is going back, and her body's not moving through space until about here. And you can see that uh, if you look at her knee, you can see that her knee really starts blasting through space there. These opposing forces with the arm going back, what it does is it actually creates a situation, and I think a lot of people have commented on it, where her hips will actually thrust forward. Uh, it gives the appearance of that. We're not actually thrusting our hips. It's the stretch of our arm traveling rearward. rearward excuse me. Uh, it's the stretch of her arm traveling rearward and the momentum of her body traveling forward uh, that makes her hips come forward like that. So there's that, that thrust there. Okay, This is overlap. This is a, a, a ballistic sequence uh, that takes place and it's a very, very important timing piece. So again, uh, just to go back, I'd like to see the picture start uh, with the hands up into the body at chest level. Um, one of the things that we can do if their if their uh, backswing is too connected is tell them to delay the onset or the beginning of that backswing. Um, make sure that they they feel that as if they're completing their rearward move um, before really uh, you know letting that arm go back. The truth of the matter is they won't. I mean, they'll still be partially connected, but the slightest bit of delay goes very very far in creating that that overlapping sequence where the body's going forward as the arm's going backwards, okay? That right there, uh, very, very critical piece. What it actually creates for the pitcher, for those of you that have ever thrown a ball, um, is it creates a feel of, of stretch, uh, a feel of, of being rushed in your backswing. You feel like you have to come up. So what we don't want with the pitcher is we don't want the backswing to really come to a pause. So we need to create a feel where it's a little rushed. Will it shorten the backswing? Not a whole lot, but it will definitely feel that way to the pitcher. And as you can see here, as she gets to the top, her hand is coming down as soon as it reaches its peak. There's no pause. And that's due in part to the overlapping sequence again of her body heading forward as her arm is heading backwards. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about um, is a very important concept in this drill and it's referred to as uh, sprinter's position. Okay, uh, sprinter's position is this position right here, all right, where you have the whole the rear stride leg and the upper torso connected. The overlapping sequence, as we talked about before, will straighten the spine uh, and allow for the straight line to, con uh, to form. So again, uh, if your daughter is struggling reaching this particular position, you need to go back and fix the overlap sequence. You need to delay the onset of the glove swing or the backswing um, so that um, she can actually uh, have that overlapping sequence where her body is moving forward as her arm is moving rearward. Okay, So in looking at that, this sprinter's position that we mentioned, it's really important to note shin angle. Okay, and this is where I see a lot of people going wrong. All right, we, this is what these are what I call positive shin angles, where our goal is to get our two shins as parallel to one another as possible. All right, and they're in a positive fashion. They're angled forward. All right, as you can see, the rear leg is always going to be that. Where most people go wrong is they go to actually take the second step. They do so with their foot directly underneath their knee. And the result of that step is a forward step, uh, what some call a gym step. All right, and that is definitely illegal. But what I don't want them doing is I don't want them establishing a neutral a shin angle or a negative shin angle where they literally are stepping forward. Again, how do we do that? We need to make sure that uh, the backswing is delayed uh, to create that overlapping sequence. Okay, and now if we watch this and you can see how marvelously this foot is floating um, over space here. Um, when she goes to push, let's take a look at where she started and note that position on the floor. She's a few inches behind this green line and if we really keep you know, the cursor on there, as you can see, that as she goes to step, it may appear she's actually moving forward, but you can see now that this is an inward move, okay? Her foot is traveling 
in a plantar flexed toe down heel up sequence it's traveling rearward okay it's moving back and in and down per se so back and down against the rubber uh, I've been asked on uh, many occasions um, if a rolling start is okay and a rolling start uh, if you look at gait analysis you know uh, really the role of the foot um, during forward motion you'll notice that uh, often in much of the activities that we perform such as walking uh, general running uh, it's always in a heel strike to a midfoot to a toe uh, fashion so the sequence is heel midfoot forefoot not in sprinting Okay, so if we take a look at this uh, picture here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you a pattern of the foot. As you can see, I am a huge stickler uh, with making sure that they do not allow their heel to ever come in contact with the plate. Okay, uh, as you can see, the direction of the foot is definitely backward and down. Okay, and this allows for her forefoot and her big toe um, to uh, truly take all of the weight of, of her body um, and what that does from a physics standpoint is it uh, from a physics standpoint excuse me is that it quickens what's known as an impulse okay um, if we had a slow rocking heel midfoot toe pattern uh, we would have a l much longer impulse and the uh, rigidity of this lever which the foot is acting as a lever at this point would be uh, lessened uh, meaning that it would take us longer um, to uh, directively apply force. So in this particular instance, uh, if you look here, let's take a look at why I'm not a huge fan of, um, let's get a different line here, why I'm not a huge fan of a flat foot push. It should never take place and it's suboptimal. And the reason being is if we look at this line and we look here is at this point being the heel, and the middle being the midfoot, and the front being the forefoot. Let's take a look at it, um, how forces are applied uh, in on that line. Okay, so if our heel were to come in contact first, or if we were to push from our, our heel, the force that we're exerting with our heel is downward. Um, and although we do know in physics that um, you know when we apply a force, an equal force in magnitude is reflected in an opposite direction, in gait analysis, uh, it's actually been proven that most downward forces are completely absorbed. Um, and in lieu of the fact that some energy were to be returned, I think we all agree that that energy is in a direction that we do not want the picture heading, which is up. Okay, we want the picture heading outward. Okay, so the heel uh, in pitching is absolutely useless uh, when you look at driving off of the rubber. And if we look at the midfoot, I think you're going to find the same thing. I know you're going to find the same thing. I should say that the force applied is more downward. Again, most of that force will be absorbed. What is not will be returned in a very much more upward than forward fashion. Okay. Um, in this particular picture, though, you can see that her foot is plantar flexed. Her toe is down. Her heel is up. It's meant to be rigid. It's not. Uh, she's been instructed not to allow her heel to touch whatsoever. And the result of that is a force that is applied in this direction. So if we start here, okay, and we go here, you're going to see a line that is applied in this direction. Okay, or the resultant force is. This is the force being applied, and the resultant force uh, is not absorbed. It's reflected in a forward direction, exactly where I want this picture heading. I want her heading out towards her target, not up in the air. All right, so let's go ahead and review <coughs> all the goodies that we've learned so far. I'm going to take this back to the sequence um, as we start. Taking the proper position is an absolute requisite for this drill to perform correctly. If your pitcher is not utilizing the six inches in depth, meaning that the stride toe is at the very back edge of the plate and the drive heel is the very front edge of the plate, you're performing this drill incorrectly. Uh, as we noted earlier, this pitcher could have taken a wider stance. Um, and your daughter should as well. Again, if you're not going to use the 24 inches of width or the 6 inches of depth, um, you're just hurting yourself. Okay? They're there for a reason. Use it. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at from there is after you've taken the right stance, you know the importance of delaying the onset of the backswing. Okay? The backswing takes place from this point back, so what we can do is tell her to keep still with the glove and the pitching hand uh, until she's felt like she's completed her rearward move with the stride foot, which is really getting the heel down. Okay, 
Um, that should be a focus. Um, the great thing about the two-step is that it allows you to address multiple facets of the pitch. Um, not only will it allow you to correct timing and to create a feel that uh, is much more aggressive, um, but it will also allow you to put your focus towards the drive leg and then once you've completed that, the stride leg. And that is the correct order. Get the timing, get the drive leg, then get the stride leg. Okay, so we've, we've gone through and we've talked about everything uh, timing and drive leg uh, required. Uh, we know that this down, backward, and down move of the foot right here is what we train for, that we want shin angles that are parallel to one another, um, and that we want this overlapping uh, body forward, arm rearward sequence so that our body can become straightened. After we've completed this, and she gets that really aggressive push off, the next, then the final thing on the drive leg to consider, um, and it's very, very important, and it's what I train my pitchers for, is I want that pitcher's drive foot detaching from the rubber. Okay, by the time her arm has reached three o'clock. Now, this particular clip is not long enough to really show that, but what I mean is that by when her pitching arm is here. I want her foot coming off the rubber. I want it detaching. If it hasn't, then it's a slow push. It wasn't aggressive. The impulse was too slow. She didn't actually try to get off the plate. Get off the plate first. Do so early by 3 o'clock. From there, training the stride leg is pretty simple. We've created the stretch by keeping the heel down earlier on. That was a focal point that we needed to include. From there, what we did is we engaged the Achilles, we engaged the calves, and we engaged the hamstring muscles of her legs, allowing her to get her leg out forcefully and allowing the work that those muscles performed um, to happen efficiently. Okay, my goal is not to swing the foot out. I don't put any focus on the stride foot. What I tell them to do instead is to focus on getting the, tr the knee out. I want the knee to come out so that we have, again, parallel shin angles established. By the time she's here, you can see that the angle um, of her body, okay, uh, her upper body here, and the angle formed with her uh, thigh is approaching if not close to a 90 degree angle. To me that's proper hip flexion that'll get the foot out just fine. No focus on the foot, no fo focus on planning at a given angle. I don't care about that. Okay, What I care about is that when the drive leg pushed it did so with a slight toe out to engage the large muscles in the drive leg and that the heel is recessed so that these muscles can uh, so that the muscles in the stride leg uh, can get that leg out efficiently and again focus on sending the knee out toward the catcher not up in the air okay and while doing that make sure that her heel is not going back to kick her butt what we want is we want matching angles at a certain point uh, where she works beyond that so now that she's at this angle here uh, and that, folks, is the two-step drill. I hope this was helpful. Um, I look forward to all the positive feedback and questions that you may have uh, that I may have forgotten to address. Thanks.